Hey there, and welcome to the channel. My name is Eric Hunley, and I like to cover true crime, a little body language, a little statement analysis, and I tend to bring experts on the show to cover these items with me. Today I have with me Gavin Stone, and Gavin has the honor of representing the entire British Empire <laughs> while we look into Prince Harry interviews, and I'm hoping you found me through a three-part series that we did previously. Gavin, show them where you can find it. Excellent. And in that series, we broke down his ITV interview and even went into how he's backpedaling about claims that were made in the past. Well, to continue the series by demand, we are covering the Stephen Colbert interview here in the States, which is insufferable, <laughs> I have to say. Spoiler alert. But in this interview, he's also backtracking or fighting back against a particular claim. And we are going to go into that and the rest of the interview. And again, Gavin Stone is with me. Gavin Stone is an expert on body language, statement analysis, and has actually done some work with the British military, I believe. Isn't that true? Yeah, I have worked with the, the British military, the British government. Uh, and at one point was actually an RSD for somebody who was something like 27th in line to the throne. throne. So uh, that was a long time ago. Though. What is that? Um, what's RID? Uh, RSD, uh, Residential Security. Uh, so, so it's uh, working at the, the, the person. It was, it was actually the person's second home. Um, okay. part of the residential security team for uh, just covering while somebody was on vacation. Harry, is Harry okay? Yeah, Harry has Baz, Baza, Spike, Bazaruni, it's all there. <laughs> Bazaruni? Yeah. Prince Bazaruni? No, the prince doesn't come before that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, very interesting. Now, I'm going to, to cheat because you were talking about it in a previous interviews, mm -hmm. and that is how everything to the right is positive and everything to the left is negative. Mm -hmm. And in that little tiny segment, other than the crazy ass nicknames, good God, dude, <laughs> what is going on there? Um, it appears that Prince might not be a positive thing to him. I think there's possibly some connection to the fact that he's um, been painted into a bit of a corner with regards to his... <laughs> Uh, lack of desire to give up the title, mm. shall we say. Uh, you know, he, he's kind of been told, uh, you know, you, you don't want to be part of the family, yet you want to keep the title. Uh, he doesn't see the problem with it, but a lot of other people do see the problem with it. So maybe it's connected to that somehow. Not 100% sure. Would you like a cocktail before we begin? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I feel like he really does want that cocktail. Oh, yeah. And and I, I, if you've noticed, compared to the last interview, which was a lot more formal, um, a lot more structured, this seems to be, he seems to be getting very comfortable now, getting used to the idea of what's going on and how it's all going to play out. And, and, and he knows what his answers are going to be. So he, he's been a, a, a little bit more playful with it. It's possible he may have even already had a few drinks backstage before he's even started, just as a little bit of Dutch courage. <laughs> I would also say that he is in a very friendly environment. I don't feel like Harry is going to be challenged in this interview. No, no, unlike others. Possibly. Spoiler alert, he <laughs> isn't. <laughs> don't have to get him drunk. All right, are you glad? No. Okay, I'm not a body language expert, but boy, mm, that, that drink <laughs> looks really good. Is that just me or? <laughs> I think he was pretty much watching that getting poured with, uh, you know, kind of <laughs> uh, watching every second of and every drip of it going. So, yeah, it was uh, quite interesting. And, and um, I don't know whether I should spoil and say that uh, it, it, it's it's not his only drink during this show. Mm, no, no. But may, maybe it's the brand of tequila, Gavin. Possibly. May, maybe, you know what, he doesn't normally get that. And he's like, oh, this is the best tequila. <laughs> I can't wait. But... It's unusual. It is unusual. And I'm somebody who does like to tip a drink back. So don't get me wrong. I love my beer. But um, 
I don't usually do it on Colbert. Te- tequila is nice, to be fair. And you know, for, for the tequila drinkers out there, I, I like the white tequila because apparently white tequila doesn't give you a hangover, where gold does. So Allegedly. Allegedly. But perhaps the, or no, not perhaps, without doubt, the most dangerous lie that they have told is that I somehow boasted about the number of people that I killed in Afghanistan. Boom. This is now him again on his bandwagon press bad press bad mommy died same routine and now he's accusing the press of using his own words against him so let's go ahead i actually went to the book let's listen so my number 25 it wasn't a number that gave me any satisfaction but neither was it a number that made me feel ashamed. Naturally, I'd have preferred not to have that number on my military CV, on my mind, but by the same token, I'd have preferred to live in a world in which there was no Taliban, a world without war. Even for an occasional practitioner of magical thinking like me, however, some realities just can't be changed. While in the heat and fog of combat, I didn't think of those 25 as people, You can't kill people if you think of them as people. You can't really harm people if you think of them as people. They were chess pieces removed from the board. Bads taken away before they could kill goods. Okay, Gavin. Hmm. (laughs) You've not only been around the military, Mm -hmm. and I've been around the military and actually in the military. Mm -hmm. I've never come across soldiers talking about the quantity of kills Mm. except for cases of in like snipers where they do track actual confirmations like carlos hathcock Mm -hmm. that's very weird i don't know about you but i just find it very weird it's exactly the same side of the pond it's it's not the done thing in fact more importantly um the, the, there seems to be this kind of um, difference between civilians and soldiers where civilians might ask, have you ever killed anybody uh, or how many people have you killed? And soldiers will generally stray away from answering the question. Not always, but generally. Um, and and then even, even then, though, an answer would be, I was in a war. Yeah. Yes. What do you think? You know, um, or, but well, but not not... Yes, twenty five. You know, it, it, it's not not very good, not very clever, and 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 I don't think it should be done. Um, I think there was only one occasion where I know somebody who talked about the number of people he killed while he was in the army, but that was because he was a chef. Uh. <laughs> oh, come on now! <laughs> oh, that was that that was just wrong. That was. Oh, wrong. I had to ch- I had to change the tone a little, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, well, uh, on that note, what I think is interesting, and we talked about it, is he used the word or the number 25, mm-hmm. 12 times in this book. And, and the reason why I found this, it, it was not like an intent. It was like, I want to find the sound clip of his saying that. So let mm-hmm. me go find the words. Let me search for 25 find the approximate location, then go to the audio book, find the clip so I can, you know, get it all put together. Then when I searched the book, I was like scrolling 25, 25, 25, 25, 25. I'm like, what the hell? It's very interesting. Um, He uses 25 a lot. Uh, It was the first time in 25 years that such a thing had been done, was turning 25 in a few days. Yeah, it's a birthday, no biggie. Mates told me 25 is a watershed age, the moment when many young men and women come to a fork. Um, At 25, you take a concrete step forward or else begin to slide backwards. I reminded myself that it ran the family, that 25 had been a big year for many of us. At 25, she became the 61st monarch in the history of England. These are all on the same page, by the way. So very heavy on the 25 in that, that sequence. So it makes sense. His birthday. So all things related to 25. Okay. Then this is where it gets interesting. We ran to the Apaches, flew north at a good clip, 25 feet off the ground. Mm-hmm. And then on to, so my number, 
25, which we just heard. While in the heat and fog of combat, I didn't think of those 25 pe as people. Hmm. Those are on the same page. So he's got his 25 birthday collection, couple here, talking about the kills. Then 693, another instance. After Meg and I demolished their lie with a 25-page evidence-filled report to Human Resources, hmm. then for nearly 25 years, we've reserved that soul-crushing vow for times when one of us needed to be heard to be believed. And then in the epilogue, the old-fashioned basins, the tub, everything the same as it had been 25 years ago. Wow. Well, there's something that will set off the conspiracy theorists. <laughs> it could be completely meaningless, and I freely acknowledge, like, the birthday, it's a seminal event, whatever. But what really struck me is that whole 25 kills, Blackhawk, 25 feet. Or, or mm. Apache. Sorry, it was Apache, right? Mm. Um, 25, 25. Now, statement analysis, there are things with numbers, like the rules of three. That's right, yeah. And I'm wondering, Gavin, is there anything that you know of in terms of uh, a repeated number or, or some, something to that instance? Not that I can think of in statement analysis. I know that three is generally something which is a, a, a default number that people will go to, um, you know, if, if they are being deceitful. It doesn't mean people are always being deceitful when they use the number three, but it might be things like, you know, three times I tried to call you or three times I came around your house because it sounds like a believable number. There are three um, guys. Yeah, These three yeah. guys. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's three for, for, for people being deceitful is, is generally the, the, like I said, the default number. So be, because of the fact that it does sound believable. So um, perhaps for him, 25 is, is something that for him is, is like his believable sounding number. It's not a grand number. It's not up near the hundreds. It's not a low number. It's not a single digit number. Um, so perhaps maybe that, that's just something that for him, he's comfortable in using. If, uh, I've if got one other idea too. Go, go for it. Princess Di died 25 years prior to this book being written. She died in 1997. 97. The book just came out, so he was likely writing it or coming into the 25th year mm -hmm. with her, you know, of, of you know, the anniversary of her passing. So I'm wondering if that may be amplifying it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, highly possible. It is possible. Uh, well, um, for those who believe in the spiritual side of things, 25 also uh, denotes chaos and destruction, um, as well as new beginnings and what's the wrong here? Uh, good news. Um, 12. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that covers the range. Chaos oh, no, and yeah. destruction on the one hand, or good news. Yeah. Well, uh, it's going to be one. Jeez. I know. 12 is closely associated to the heavens, and if you times 25 by 12 and get 300, then that's apparently um, associated to freedom and wholeness. So I looked into these really quickly. Uh, and and, and then there's 300 mm -hmm. who, um, fought in the Battle of Thermophilae. What is it? <laughs> uh, Th that battle and then they made a movie oh my god that's so it so there we go we said we'd drive the conspiracy theorists while you know you can you can do anything you want with these numbers oh yeah there was something to do with numerology as well if um the 25 had the 12 with 37 and then something to do with numerology was all to do with i think it was new beginnings and fresh starts uh oh and, and um and being looked up looked over by a guardian angel so there you go uh, a little bit of something if you wanted to really go down that path and uh, and you know start googling the numbers it's some fun to play with because someone asked me a question while I was still in Afghanistan um, if I had killed anybody from an attack helicopter. Um, and I said yes. Okay. So somebody asked him if he killed somebody, mm -hmm. apparently in the past. So his claim is that this has been out there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he said 25 then. Mm -hmm. I haven't found it. I'd have to verify it. But he claims that they asked him in the past, so he told them, fair enough, let's continue, listen to the rest. And I think the most important thing here is not only the context, but the reason as to why I decided to share this in my book. Because, again, to the vets here and to the civilians here, which may seem, may feel as though this is slightly a weird conversation to have, um, especially on this show of all shows, but 
I made a choice to share it because having spent nearly two decades working with veterans all around the world, I think the most important thing is to be honest and be able to give space to others to be able to share their experiences without any shame. And my whole goal and my attempt with sharing that detail is to reduce the number of suicides. Okay, so stop that. Just for a second. Hold on. <laughs> Why would releasing the number 25 reduce suicides? Not a clue. I mean, you know, I, I'm just visualizing some veteran that's about to top himself. Uh, and realizes that, um, you know, Prince Harry's killed 25 people and goes, oh, therefore I don't have to do it. Come on, what? How the hell are those two linked in any way? He actually got a round of applause after saying that as well. And it, it just seems like he decided to stick some kind of a spin on, on the entire statement at the last minute and to try and win over the hearts and minds of the audience in the room at the time, because that sentence makes absolutely zero sense, in my opinion. I'm a little offended by it. I, 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 I genuinely am. I do not understand how revealing this, especially a specific number like that. Mm -hmm. Now, if he said that I caused harm or I did this or I was broken up because of the lives that were lost, I get all that. I get that because that's, you know, to help uh, create empathy for someone else who may have suffered uh, by doing, but, the specificity? Yeah, I don't know. I please comment below what you think, and yeah, and and and, and tell and tell us if you think that this is going to help. Yeah, that, I think that was just a just a play to to kind of win people over a little bit with with where he was going with this because, like I say, it doesn't make any sense. Um, there's half a possibility that he wanted to say something along the lines of, you know, sharing my thoughts on these things and, and what I've done has helped me. Yeah. And I think it might help others rather than, you know, kind of going down the route of suicide and depression, you know, find somebody to share it with. It might help you. Uh, and, and just made a real poor job of it, if you don't mind me saying. Um, but, you know, uh, I, he should have, uh, I, don't, I don't even know where to start. It, it's almost embarrassing to watch that. Um, and, I, and I'm, I'm sorry on behalf of everybody who's British um, that they've had to endure hearing that sentence come from the prince's mouth. Yeah, I, I'm going to go one more theory that it could be put up as a shield. The same way as I feel like he puts up his mother's passing as a shield, mm -hmm. that uh, if you are criticizing him, then you are criticizing soldiers Mm. who are depressed I, I i kind of am wondering if that might be some of the motivation behind what he just did there don't know possibly, but possibly. um i found my purpose um a purpose greater than myself and to be amongst comrades wearing the same uniform being treated uh no longer being treated differently for the first time in my life and being able to hide away from the from the media focus for me that was that was an amazing place to be in an amazing community and i still am part of that community so they will do everything they can to try and uh, disrupt that. So there's that incongruent shoulder shrug again at the very beginning where he says, I found my purpose. And he gives that shoulder shrug as he says it, and he does it a couple of times, um, which we discussed in some of the last videos. I'm not going to repeat myself. Uh, for anybody who haven't seen them, then you know, please pop back and have a look. Um, but it, it, it's not congruent. So you know, he, he's saying, I found my purpose. But, you know, not 100% sure he had. Um, and then secondly, I love the little bit where he's he's talking and says something along the lines of, um, uh, let me get it right. Uh, I was treated, I wasn't treated dip. And then he stops and he says, I was treated the same as everybody else. Or it was the other way around. No um, longer being treated differently. Yeah, that's the one. Um, and we know the truth there. <laughs> and everybody knows the truth there and any soldier that's ever served with him is going to know the truth there because he's the prince he's a member of the royal family and if you were on that if you were if you were you know with him on tour then you know full well he was treated differently and i think that's why he said you know, uh, changed his sentence mid midway through from, you know, I was no longer treated differently to I was treated the same as other people in uniform or whatever, whatever 
kind of um, shift he made uh, because I think that could have potentially caused him a hell of a lot of problems. Well, there wouldn't be those photos if the public didn't go buy those magazines. Do you have a conflicted feeling about how the audience for that kind of salacious work that gets sold uh, aid and abets uh, it? Yeah, I think, um, I think so many of us um, feed into it. A lot of us feed into it without realizing it. Okay, uh, a non-answer there. Very good point by Colbert, actually. The whole, mm -hmm. hey, there are people who are buying this stuff, so they want to hear it. What do you have to say about that? And he doesn't seem to want to acknowledge that. No. You've got the big eye blocking at the beginning there, where he closes his eyes, where he's going, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. And he starts his sentence off. Um, again, by doing that, if he were to turn around and say, yeah, if these people stopped buying these bloody newspapers that they kept printing with these salacious headlines, he's then alienated the entire population of his followers who buy the headlines because they're reading about the royal family. And he would be literally going against the grain and saying, yeah, you're all to blame. All you people, you're all buying my book. Yeah, it's your fault. <laughs> um, so, you know, so he has to be very, very, very careful with his answer there. And that's why I think he went down that route of saying, hmm, yeah, you know, and was very evasive with it. So you think you think he wants to be careful being celebrating right now the most uh, the quickest selling non-fiction book in history according to the guinness book of world records right now you, wow, you think no. that might show a little bit of hypocrisy <laughs> just a little <laughs> well there wouldn't be those photos if the public didn't go buy those magazines do you have a conflicted feeling about how the audience for that kind of salacious work that gets sold uh aid and abets uh, it yeah. i think um i think so many of us um feed into it a lot of us feed into it without realizing it mm -hmm. we I fled they were chasing oh, no. him with helicopters. He was like, <laughs> it's like Jason Bourne. Whoa, yeah. whoa, running through the... <laughs> Come on. Oh, dear, dear. Um, yeah, so, I mean, he, he, he did everything short of saying he was an asylum seeker. Um, you know, um, and, and I'm not going to go too deep into that. People know that he didn't flee his own country in fear of his life. So, I mean, because that, that's just that's just not the truth. So when he said, I fled my country, he didn't flee. Well, again, he's playing these games, though, because the, the security and stuff. Like, oh, I didn't have security, so I had to flee to mm. Tyler Perry's home. Oh, he had security. <laughs> um, it was just, uh, I think there was a debate on, on how much security him and his extended family were going to get. But, um, again, I don't know the facts and details on that, so I'm not going to go into it. Interestingly, though, if you look at his hand gestures, when he starts off talking about his family and his life and he's on the negative side until he talks about that he's moving to California and setting up his new life until he's on the positive side, it's interesting how he's gone from, um, and again, for anybody who doesn't know what we're on about here, we've established with in the past when he's talking about anything negative, he's on the left. If he's talking about something positive, he uses his right hand or both hands. Um, so what you've got is he's is, is going from this left-hand side of this negative, being with the family, being stuck in this position, fleeing my own country, moving to America, living in California. So he's gone from a negative to a positive. Um, so, he, he, you know, to, to him, California is this positive thing. Being back home is this negative thing. Uh, and that's how it's panned out in his mind. Yep. But with regard to my family, you, you hit on a really important point, which is we were forced to leave. We left in 2020. We moved... Our, we fled my home country, we moved to California, and for 12 months during lockdown where we said literally nothing, it was relentless. What are your thoughts, Eric? My <laughs> thoughts are rude. I'm going to leave that to the comments. That's one of those. Everyone, caption this photo. <laughs> Just caption this photo. No words. No. I don't think we need to analyze it. No. It's very, very distinctly Harry and Colbert. <laughs> and it leads back to my question that I asked before. This is on another video, so I'm going to introduce it here. Who is more insufferable? <laughs> Chris Cuomo interviewing Alec Baldwin or Stephen Colbert interviewing Prince Harry? Also comment below. <laughs> Again, one of the reasons what I wrote this book is 
I, every word in that book is mine. And I realize that especially... What do, you, what, do you, what, what do you mean by that? Because the amount of unnamed sources that have fed information to the British tabloids oh. about me and my wife and my family... You have a source true and it's you. ...true and not true. I am the source of that book. And the... He is the source of that book. Mm -hmm. Those are his words, right? Mm -hmm. Not the <laughs> ghostwriter. Never mind mm -hmm. he had a ghostwriter that put all the words together. But, but those are his words. So I think that's great. That's wonderful that he's reinforcing it. And anybody being critical of it, well, Harry, those are those are your words. Yep. So now we can quote it as you know, saying, that, well, you said it. Um, however, did you notice his posture upon the finishing, uh, the, the finishing of the sentence where he said, every word in that book is mine? Um, it's really, really interesting because it's almost, he's got this kind of so there look on his face. Um, you know, it's kind of every word in that book is mine, <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, and uh, he almost looks like you know, like Mowgli from Jungle Book. You know, kind of you know, um, it, it's really, really kind of evident. You know, like, where where he, he's giving that that look on his face at the end of that sentence. Um, very adamant, very proud of the fact that you know that this is his book and his words. When we actually know it's not. Um, it's it's the words of a ghostwriter. Um, it. it but the way that works is the ghostwriter tells the, uh, the, the sorry, the, the the prince in this situation or Harry would have told the ghostwriter what to write and then the ghostwriter writes it. But sure. I'm convinced that 99.9% .9 of people on planet Earth are walking around with some form of unresolved grief, trauma or loss. And with that comes these filters of which is acts as a fog and every opportunity we have to be able to clean the windscreen, take the filters away and actually see life as it is and be able to live a truly authentic life. That to me has been the freedom that I've been looking, that I didn't even know that I was looking for for most of my life. Now, I love this segment because you and I talked offline and you were pointing out to me something about this and you were talking about, and I don't know if it's statement analysis or body language, they blend over quite a bit. So these, these are just observable, observable things might even be psychology, but we tend to describe the world around us in terms of either a visual, an auditory, or a kinetic, I think you said, which is the yeah. touch, or kinesthetic. Yeah. And Harry, you broke down the transcript that I sent you of this I interview, yeah. um, and noticed that Harry very distinctly uses one of those three and what was that there it is um i think the light is, is not showing it very well um so yeah so the, the way the way it works is people are either visual audible or kinesthetic primarily with with how they talk so you will use other things as well but there's generally one which is stronger than all the others. So to give people an idea of, of, of what this is, people who are visual people will say things like, do you see what I'm saying? Um, I do see things my way. I, I just don't visualize it. Words which are, which are sight orientated. Then you've got audible people who will say things like, do you hear me? Um, you know, do, 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 do you hear what, you know, that doesn't it sounds sound like you're telling me yeah, exactly. how this breaks down. Yeah. And then finally, you've got your kinesthetic people who turn around and say, I've just got a feeling about this. Uh, it doesn't feel right or, or, you know, or whatever the case may be. They're very, very kind of, um, you know, kind of, it's all, it's all about how they feel and how they think. So what I did is I did the, um, from, from the uh, transcript you sent me, I went through and I went through his own words in that transcript um let me just double check the numbers for you so they are there was 19 visual words 22 audible words and 108 kinesthetic words so this means that he is a kinesthetic person he is somebody who, when he's normally talking talks about the way something feels or if he thinks something's wrong or right. He's not so much of a visual person or an audible person. In fact, visual was the lowest scoring on all of it. So now, that, this is yeah. not completely surprising um, in an odd way. I don't know if you knew this, but redheads, specifically gingers, have increased anesthetic requirements for surgeries because they feel more pain mm -hmm. this is this is actual science here it's it's something that's been put out and studied 
So anesthesiologists have to give them more pain medication, um, et cetera, prior to surgery because they feel more. So yes. it, it's just an interesting point. I don't know if you had ever considered that, that, you know, he is a ginger slash redhead and they feel more pain. Yeah. So, and I actually didn't know that until you told me earlier. So that stands to reason why he would be more of a feeling person than a visual person. So, I mean, that, that that's brilliant. And, and when you look at that with that last clip, and he's on about the fog and, and the blinkers and, and the mist and, and the clearing so you can see where you're going and see what's happening. I don't think those are his words. I don't think those are his words at all. I think he's repeating something that maybe Sanja Oakley said, um, which for anybody who doesn't know who Sanja Oakley is, that's his therapist in London. So she's on, on Regent Street in London. Um, so we're just, you know, kind of... Uh, I don't, I don't know whether most people knew that or not, um, but I reckon it's possibly something that she said to him. Uh, he's taken on board and he's repeated either that or it's possibly maybe a passage book. in the book. Yeah, maybe. A, is it a passage in the book, is it? No, I'm saying it could be the book. It oh, could right, be yeah. the ghostwriter's yeah. terminology. Yeah. That, that, that uh, maybe my the ghostwriter is a visual um, you know, person, which, by the way, would make a lot of sense. Yes. Um, authors tend to be very visual or a lot of successful ones are very, very visual and it translates nicely to movies and things like that. So yes. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it is interesting when he is going against his mm -hmm. nature in describing things. It does make mm -hmm. you wonder, is this his own script or somebody else's? There is a third option, of course. And that is the fact that it might be his wife's words. Sure. Um, she has a lot of influence over what he says, sees, and thinks. Um, she has a lot of input in his life in many, many ways. I think she influences a lot of what happens, and it's possible that, you know, these are something that uh, words that have been said to him many times by her, um, and he's now regurgitating them on stage. But I don't believe they are his words or the type of things that he would say uh, from his own thoughts. So, and again, and maybe they're used to seeing things happening that aren't actually happening. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> and you talk about this all through this book, and this is one of the things that was so resonant to me, mm -hmm. was the belief that, no, my mother is alive. She's out there someplace, yeah. and someday she will show up. That's a recurring theme throughout this. Now, that's true. And again, I, I don't want to bang on about it because it is a genuine loss. And, and it, that always you know feels hard. You can see that he is genuinely affected by his mother i will say that he uses it as a defense all the time i will also acknowledge that he probably genuinely feels it mm -hmm. yeah if you look um at the beginning when he's been first questioned and and before his answer and during his answer uh first time his eyes go down and right second time his whole head goes down and right and he's looking down and right this is an emotional eye accessing cue um greg hartley's favorites i know i know it's one of his great he had me and my wife absolutely in hysterics the one night where he turned around and said if you want to bum yourself out just spend the night looking down and right <laughs> it'll totally ruin you i'm like yeah thanks thanks greg if ever i want to do that that's <laughs> i'll bear that in mind um so uh you know but the, the, if you look at that clip you know two or three times his eyes go down and right uh, and his head goes down and right so there is definitely genuine emotion there is definitely genuine kind of um i mean obviously Obviously there is because it's his mother dying at the end of the day but it's still there it's still resident it's still very prominent in his life so you know i just thought that was worth mentioning it's not just something that he's become numb to and uses as a defense mechanism or as an excuse it is still something that he's feeling it's a definite focus and by the way folks um this is greg hartley of the behavior panel good mm -hmm. friends of ours and also an author of i believe 10 books yeah. on body language so you know check him out you can find him on this channel you can find the whole behavior channel on this behavior panel on this channel as well hiding i'm not going to accuse you and megan of hiding but removing yourself from the situation this fantasy that you had of what your mother did is what you did you removed yourself from the toxic situation yeah and i'm glad by the way i'm glad that it <laughs> There I we just... go. We tie it back to his mother again. And I, I want to point out another, I don't even remember it because they all run together, mm -hmm. but um, his mother was 38 years old when, or 36, 36. years old, I believe 36. when she split and then 38 when she passed, I think. Mm -hmm. But Harry did the whole routine with Megan 
when he was 36. So the, he's there's a lot of these little parallels in there that are that are kind of interesting. He's, he's got his beliefs of what happened, but it is interesting that yeah, his mom, his mom died when he was 36, and and this all started when he was 36. You know, and and uh, sorry, his mom died when she was 36, and this all started when he was 36. And he's kind of continued where she left off by by running away with the foreigner. Uh, to a different country, you know, to kind of have their life of privacy. Um, it, it, it is really, really interesting where all those parallels come in. So yet another one for all the conspiracy theorists. To be in the spirit of Harry and Meghan, who extracted themselves or removed themselves from their, their country, Gavin and I are going to remove ourselves from that interview. <laughs> and definitely please tell us below what you think there are several questions to answer and we definitely want to hear from you if you like this kind of thing please consider subscribing and check out gavin there's a link to gavin inside of the description there will also be a link to his page on the end screen and let us know what you think i think we're probably done with harry for a little bit unless you want us to do something else i don't know but i think we've got a general idea we know what he's about he's repeated the same things over and over so until next time we may be doing something on logan paul coming up mm, possible <laughs>